Okay. Today we have with us Dr. Jayashrika Karatil. Uh, tell me if my, if my pronunciation of the name is <laughs> wrong. Uh, Dr. Jayashrika Karatil. Yes, that's yeah, fine. Sorry? That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Uh, she's a writer translator based in London. She's the London. She's the author of the children's book, The Sackcloth Man, which has been translated into Malayalam, Telugu, and Hindi. Jayashrika's translation of S. Arish's novel, Mustache won the JCB Prize for Literature 2020. Her translation of a collection of novels by N. Prabhakaran, Diary of a Malayali Madman, won the Crossword Book uh, Jury Award for Indian Language Translation and was longlisted for the 2020 Matrabhumi Book of the Year Award. N. Prabhakaran's Theur Chronicles is her latest translation. Outside literary pursuits, Jayashrika is a researcher and activist working in the mental health, anti-racism and human rights and has published widely in the in this area including recovery and resilience african african caribbean and south asian women's stories of recovering from mental diseases distress sorry and the, and the co-author textbook values and ethics in mental health and she has for our information she has also lived in pune for two years wow uh, okay i don't you can start with your question it was i think it's a good place to start Yes, uh, I was asking that uh, how long did it uh, take for uh, Isharish to write this book and how long did it take for you to translate it? Because it's, a, it's really a vast book, you know, in terms of character, in terms of detail, in terms of uh, history and mythology and... everything together so interwoven i'm very impressed i can't express my feeling thank you um as far as i know i think harish took 5 or 6 years to write the book although he didn't i mean i don't think he wrote it continuously in that time like i was saying earlier before we started recording the session that he did a lot of traveling around kutanada doing a lot of research uh, for the book etc yeah um i didn't have that much time um it took me about i think about 10 to 11 months but within that time 3 or 3 to 5 months was like just this book um sort of focused work on it um because obviously you know um as a translator you have the author's voice author's text right there that's your guide you know so you know it's it's easier in that way because you're not also developing a story etc the story has been developed for you already um i did also do a bit of research because i did i read up a lot about farming um, the construction of fields in kutanada from water as it were from marshes you know um so a lot of below sea level farming lot of information about that i anyway i absolutely love researching nature um and so that was just fun you know sort of looking up birds and fish and plants and pouring through all these various online and offline i have a collection of nature books here um, kerala's nature books so you know it was great doing that but yeah a lot of work to also reading up on sort of caste histories etc so some background work was necessary for me as well but not perhaps as much as for harish maybe just uh, i mean i have many questions but maybe i'll i'll just uh, you know for the time being i'll just ask another one i mean i mean it appeared to me and later but uh, i don't know for sure whether it is true that uh, harish worked in the revenue department did it help because many of the times he knows the history of the land the particular land and he knows that you know which land belongs to whom and you know how it came to be interesting because i don't think we have ever actually talked about that um but he did say that he's done a lot of research about the area about the history of the region etc so that definitely would have helped i think whether being a revenue uh, working in the revenue department helped i don't know because we haven't really actually discussed that thank you so much there uh, since we're on misha I, there is a bit of separation between you and uh, the main character main character of the story babachan like and even the even the author right like 
the main character is a masculine rural lower caste man who set a well, story set in the early 1900s history how do we approach such a story while translating it very interesting question because you know before we get to vavachan as we were saying earlier even as a reader of malayalam it's already once removed from me like i think i've written a little bit about that in the translator's note because i from, uh, yeah you know i come from a totally different part of kerala where language even in malayalam we use different words um and i come from a shudra caste uh, in kerala we are quite a powerful sort of economically and politically powerful caste um and you know so there's lots of differences between me as a translator and the characters in the book um the story of the people in the book etc but there's a lot of my caste people in there as well who are the doing the most atrocious things to others so i am aware of what caste does definitely you know because you live caste no matter how much you say you don't we live caste we live gender every single day of our lives um so yes there there um there was a lot of difference um but as i was also saying earlier um i am not writing the story okay there is the story is already there and there is the vo voice of the author which is for me well I, i say two things like one that my loyalty as a translator is to the story first and foremost i can use my creativity i can find the best way of you know bringing the original language into english etc but i can't run away with the story i have to stick with the story um so that is a guide that helps you and then there is also a certain loyalty that um a, a translator has to show to the writer's voice the writer's use of language the writer's musicality um so there there will be bits that you kind of think that i don't like that bit or i don't like the way this sentence is or etc but you can't really change that you know you have to be loyal to the book um in that sense you know and and the difference i think is difference between me and my context and my background um, and between the main character in the book is probably helpful because rather than a hindrance because then i have to be really careful not to you know deviate from what this character's life is what this character is and what he does or what he gets done to him etc so you know i can't sort of since i don't see myself in him i have to be very very careful when i'm translating so that i don't miss out on anything or bring my own biases to work etc some parts must have been very difficult to write to right like uh bavachan attacking sita or yeah like definitely uh and not just those bits in i don't know how many of you remember the chapter where the crocodiles are being killed off yeah. i found that very hard to write um you know because there is a certain cruelty which is shown not just to the human beings but also to nature and this cruelty is gendered this cruelty is caste based and this is also greed based um power based etc and and what harish has done in the book is to not hide away from it you know he has never you know, so so a lot of lot of people have said that oh my god this book is you know really um, horrible in its portrayal of women etc you can read it that way definitely you know and and it's very obvious but the way i read it was that harish was really engaging with the idea of masculinity and what that does in the world of kutanada and in the world generally as well but specifically in the world of kutanada how is that masculinity colored and sort of shaped by gender and caste and he really you know kind of takes it apart and shows it you know so he's not shying away from examining all the kind of sharp edges or the cruelty the kind of the sort of complete sense of entitlement that masculinity has in this world so that's the way i read it rather than as you know kind of being a horrible portrait of women because i think it's a horrible portrait of men if you ask me more than horrible portrait of women but an honest portrait where you're not flinching away from the 
underbelly of things. Uh, you mentioned nature and uh, reading both these uh, this these stories in this one too, Diary of a Malayali Man. Uh, there's a lot of uh, maybe uh, subconsciously or on purpose. Do you pick and choose things which uh, denotes man's relation with nature or how how man interacts with nature? Um. So as a translator, at least for me. I have to like a book first as a reader before I translate, right? And I am drawn to books that that engage or that 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 tries to engage with how us as human beings work or relate to nature around us. Um, so that's probably why that I get, you know, I do. I I believe I tend to navigate towards more towards such books. And the book I'm currently doing. Um, is about you know even northern northernmost part of Kerala based in Vayanad, um, which is known for its spice plantations and black pepper and cardamom, all of those tea, coffee, etc. But all of this built on indigenous land, indigenous tribal resources, which was freely held by everybody who looked after the forest, etc. And then people from the plains migrate up into the hills and you know they are the people who then build these things they are also looking for a better life you know for their for themselves and for their family and so this interaction between the forest the people of the forest and the other people who have come here to try and build a life you know so i do tend to get attracted to and what that does to people because you know the language the, the tribal language is used in the book but that language doesn't have a written script. So it's very, I mean, I'm trying to figure out what to do now because um, the author, Sheila Tommy, has very clearly sort of dedicated this book to the forest and also to its people. So one way of translating that would be to take out all the Paniya language. Paniya is the community um, of uh, indigenous people. Um, whose language is different from Malayalam. Although it is, if you try to write it down, you use the Malayalam script to write it down. One way of doing that would be to sort of just take it away and just put it back into like, as part of the rest of the English in the book. But that would be, you know, a further silencing of a language that has already been silenced by migration, by taking over forest resources, et cetera. So it's also it's also not just becomes a creative question; it becomes a political question. What do you do in order to preserve that language? And yeah, that will be interesting. As someone whose whose language Tulu doesn't have a script of its own, it, that that relates to me. Uh, uh, does anyone have any other questions? I'll... I, I, I have, it, it came to me suddenly, so I, I, I was about to ask if, if this time, it is this that, uh, just read this distance you have, you are in London right now, or yes. are you with, okay. so this distance you have, you know, from Kerala, and you probably, you've been living there for a few years, or I do not know, so please forgive my ignorance, so this distance, and when you also, uh, look at London lit literary market. I'm calling it a market because, of course, right? It's a market, and how uh, they treat language, the kind of language that is popular. You know, uh, people accept uh, more readily there, and that market is quite big, right? So, so this distance and this enticement that uh, the demand of the market uh, do they do they bother you? Do they disturb you or? Is it an advantage? Am I clear in my question? Yeah. So, okay. There, are, I think there are two, three different things in your question. Um, let's address the market question first. Um, I am really not um, very aware of what the market demands, specifically in London. You know, I'm aware of literary trends or publishing trends around the world. Um, but in terms of London's literary market, I don't quite know because I don't engage with it. Um, my engagement in terms of writing 
why in the I've been here 18 years now um, and published here, but that is academic writing and that has that's really not to do with market, you know, um, um, at least in my case, because I'm not an academic working within an academic institution. I work in the activist space as an academic. So, you know, so I'm not part of any university or anything. So one of the ways in which I have approached it is that um, pretty much all of my work is available freely online for everybody to have. Um, um, so, but when you come back to the rest of your question, um, the question about language and what is the demand of that, et cetera. And it also connects to translation as a literary genre as well, I think. Um, so my work is very much within the anti-racist movement here. So I'm very aware of, in terms of language, what that does. Because there is a, you know, as a migrant, um, you you are constantly in translation you know from the from your word the way you dress the food you eat the books you read your accent in your sound all of this you're constantly in translation while you and especially when you live in the colonialist country um so i'm quite aware of what that does you know and and also there is the other demand about which english is english you know english looked upon as this universal language or english literature looked upon as universal but the just the uk has so many different english literatures there is the literature of the south asian diaspora there is the literature of the black british community there is the literature of the various countries that is the welsh literature the scottish literature etc um all of which use so many different languages so there isn't a given one language and if i think there are parts of the publishing industry who might be demanding books written in a particular way uh, but at least in the last 20 years, there's been a pushback. I mean, not just in the UK, you know, globally as well, you know, African-American literature or Hispanic literature, you know, people are actively, um, you know, using their language rather than trying to, trying to footnote it for others. This is a question that brings me back to Mustache because I was asked several times about why didn't you use footnotes? So, you know, Yes, you can use footnotes. You can explain every single thing in a book for the English reader. But I want readers to, I believe that as readers, we put in some effort. I mean, I when I read British, lit, British literature written in the kind of acceptable way, I'm not asking for footnotes. I'm making my own effort to understand it because I'm also understand trying to understand the culture. Um, there's a writer called Viet Nguyen, who I don't know if you know, he's a Vietnamese American writer, um, a, 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 uh, comes from a refugee background. Um, he insists that, you know, don't footnote, don't explain, write like a migrant. So, you know, that, that, that helps, I think, as a translator sitting in, in England, when I'm trying to translate very regional literature of Kerala. Again, Kerala, Malayalam itself, there is this idea that accepted standard Malayalam, which obviously belongs to the upper caste, um, especially from the central part of Kerala. But currently, Malayalam literature is, you know, and it's always been, but more so now, it's, it's, it's very local, it's very regional, and people are not shying away from using their own language rather than catering to this idea of a standardized language. So I think sitting here with the with and working with migrant communities here and insisting upon your own kind of place in the world as it were, I think helps how I choose to translate as well. I don't know if that answers your question. It does perfectly. Thank you so much. We're we reading Bulgakov's uh, Master and Margarita right now in our in our uh, uh, okay. book club. And in the, it is full, chock full of footnotes, but in certain places, because of Russian names, right? Uh, one person is uh, maybe called five different type, five different uh, ways, and you don't know. It's it's left up to you. Similarly, I saw in uh, in, uh, in Wild Goat one of the stories. George Gutti is not his name, right? The Gutti is uh, added 
that but he's called george sometimes and uh, and also in uh, in the uh, title title story diary of a malayali madman uh, the the man and his monkey are called both are called lakshanam yes. but one is one is called lakshanam and one is called lachanetan but uh, we are not ex- you have it's it's not explicitly explained ki why these names are like that why the suffixes are like that but it's it's cool that you uh, respect the readers enough to like uh, to to uh, have make have them do their own research and look them up or just infer based on the context right so did, did you uh, consciously choose the, to do that uh, the names especially because i'm very fascinated with names yeah so uh, george george kutty's name is george kutty i mean Achha. it's a tradition in malayalam where kutty is added kutty to people's added, right. names kutty yeah. literally would mean child yeah? yeah but you know like my my grandmother is called narayani kutty that's her name her name is not just narayani her name is Achha. narayani kutty but what the difference is when when it is george kutty when you are some calling somebody it might become george kutty it become gets shortened yeah, yeah? and similarly the the suffix aten means big brother bhai big brother yeah yeah so this is why the monkey is lachanan and the man is lachanetan <laughs> right so but yeah i don't know if i want to translate all of those things because if you have understood that lachanan is the monkey and lachanetan is the man i think that's done the job right and if you really are fa- as you said like if you're fascinated you will go and find out won't you so you know i don't know i just but i think when you're translating you you do make such choices of where you want to kind of add a couple more lines which are not in the original so that the the the, the reader does not get completely thrown from the story and where to leave it alone or and also which bits that you are going to ex- which, which words you're going to explain and which you're going to leave and it's interesting that you know i think my editor and i are uh, my editor who doesn't speak malayalam is probably beginning to pick up a few malayalam words because this this eight and business you know if all older people whether they are your brothers or not as you know in many other languages in india they are all called eight and chechi or mash mash is the other one that is very 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 malayali literally means a teacher comes from master i think in terms of you know but any man who is like you know like an uncle type person uh, who is a stranger and not your uncle you might call marshal you add the suffix marshal so you know but i think and also hopefully people will read more literature in translation and that's how you become familiar with with a culture um i read a lot of japanese translations and you know you then begin to understand when you keep seeing these same things in different books that you know customs or how people are called etc angel had a question i guess so yeah i um, raised my hand because my question was related to this so sometimes when i'm reading a gujarati or a hindi translation because i'm i'm familiar with the original language then when reading the translation the voice in my head knows that how this would sound right but that then like when i was reading daisy rockwell's translation of krishna sokti's a gujarati a gujarati i knew what when a dialogue is being said what it may sound in the original but when i was reading uh, mustache i i didn't know because i don't know malayalam so uh, often when i read translations of languages that i don't know there is this annoying voice in my subconscious or in the back of my mind that you are missing out you don't know you know you are just you are taking a secondary pleasure or but for the first time when i was reading mustache like that was the first translation where i felt that this is doing this is doing something which is pushing me like i have to go and google i have to i want to learn malayalam so that because the translation had that fine balance of where you know you just choose that this has to be translated this has to be left as it is so that you push the reader to go and learn malayalam so my question was how did you make that choice like even in the previous part of this conversation you said that 
there there were some choices that you did that this has to be translated this has to be left alone yes. so how did you make that choice because that's a very interesting choice in this particular translation um okay so i'll give you an example um there is a phrase in the book to refer to the king his golden majesty now in malayalam it's ponnuthamburan and his golden majesty is a near enough literal translation of that now given the rest of the book i could have just left ponnuthamburan as it is you know um and there was you know some people did uh, write that um i had done a literal translation of misha because taking this as an example and there was no other example but this one but I'm, the reason i chose to translate that phrase was because as you read that um chapter you see that all of the kings well yeah all of them actually they are really comic characters in the book you know there is swati tirunal who is a you know for for care malayali people he is like our tagore let's say you know he wrote kirtanas and poetry and we venerate him but in the book he is a comic character who is you know kind of hiding under the bed instead of wanting to rule the state and all that kind of stuff right so you know this these people who are gold to these kings who are like like gold to it their people but turn out to be this like really comical characters i thought would come out if i translated it and be lost if i just used the word ponnuthamburan which then some people might just reading the english translation might just take it as a way of addressing a king and nothing more you know so that's the kind of thing i'm talking about you know where you choose to translate and where you don't and you know you and readers are different you know um harish has a very interesting saying that a novel a book a story is a a ball or a stone that's that you have chucked you know it's off your hand once it's written and published how it's going to hit different people you have really not much control over because or how people will react when the book hits them you have totally no control over because readers are different and they will take and readers don't come to a book with a clean state slate they come as, as the people they are and you are going to interpret the book in many different ways and i think in terms of translate to making these choices about translation i think it works for some people and some other people might not um find it working but at the moment as a translator i think the only thing i can think of is that does it work for me as a translator or a writer i beyond that i don't know i mean beyond that how do you what do you what do you do to ensure anything beyond that i don't know so it just yeah just uh, so the read is the reader like when you are writing an original often authors have this that do we have keep the reader in our mind or do we keep the reader in our mind while editing so how much is the reader on your mind when you're translating uh so this is very interesting because do you know a writer called janice pariat um she has an article recently in scroll about decolonizing literature or writing decolonizing right creative writing classes or whatever and she talks a lot about a lot of things in there about what we are taught if you ever end up in a creative writing class about you know kill your darlings and you know show don't tell and all those kind of rules right and one of the things that as a literature student i have always heard is about keeping your reader in mind um harish will tell you very clearly that he doesn't keep any reader in mind if we feed at all keeps a reader in mind it is a malayali reader you know he's writing in malayalam it's going to be a person who can read malayalam um me writing in english english it's impossible to keep a reader in mind one because there are so many different englishes in this world which english are you going to choose to write with yeah uh and two as a translator my the people who are going to read mustache are you know by and large unlike some very rare people like sini 
who are going to read both, right? Uh, they're going to read Mustache and not Misha. And the people who are reading Misha are not going to read Mustache. So it's a totally different readership. So I find it impossible to keep a reader in mind. I think what I keep in mind when I'm translating is the story. Is this story being conveyed in the best possible way that I can? And if that story works, I think it will work for readers of many different kinds. Thank you so much. Rita had a question. Um, yes, hi. Uh, yes, it's very interesting listening to, uh, you know, this talk about translations. And uh, my questions are two. Uh, one is, uh, I'm a Sindhi. So, you know, there are a lot of books that have been written. Uh, I, you know, I'm post-partition uh, child basically and uh, I do not I cannot read the in, uh, Sindhi language because okay. there are two types one is the Arabic script and the other is the Devanagari script so I can read the Devanagari because it is uh, like Hindi but uh, the other one uh, well I haven't learned it and I didn't feel the need to, I think so now the question is uh, one is how do you uh, you know uh, choose the books that you do translate. How do you, there are hundreds of books. So what makes you choose your book? And two, uh, uh, you know, I can't read the language. And um, an old aunt of mine who's a writer has asked me to translate a book into English. And uh, so now my, my conflict is that I can't read the language. I'll have her read it. And how truthful or honest can I be about writing, translating from Sindhi to English then in that case? So I just thought this is a correct forum to ask these two questions. Okay, the, the first question for me is easy to answer because I choose the books I like to read. Um, yeah. How would you know that? Because I don't read Sindhi books. No, the, I'll come to I'll come to that. Right. So oh, so oh. for me so far has been about you know I choose the books that I like to read. Except Mustache was commissioned. Okay, I didn't choose myself. So when when it was when the my editor at HarperCollins asked me whether I would translate Mustache, um, Misha was being serialized in one of the Malayalam literary uh, weeklies. And then it had to be pulled because people complained and there was a court case and all of that. So I had read the three chapters that had, was in the weekly. I hadn't read the whole book. So I told Rahul that send me the book and let me read it and then I will tell you. So that's what happened. Now, what do you do when you don't, you can't read the language? And this, this thing that you just said about, you know, your auntie, um wanting you to translate a book you could think of it as a collaborative work you know um so the two of you are working together why not you know that would be very interesting i think you know and because you understand sindhi yes. um yes. so is this written in the arabic script then this book yes it's written in the okay. arabic script and she's a very prolific writer Okay. Yeah. So I would imagine that will be a very interesting thing to do with her, you know, that she would read them out to you and, and you could even record her because, you know, you, because when, when you're doing your drafts of translation, it may not be, you know, you, you may not have her all the time reading to you. So, you know, you can keep listening again and again, um, various paragraphs where you are reworking stuff, et cetera. So maybe record her reading the book and then also have a collaborative way of, you know, how would, she, what would, what would she say about, you know, how this passage works or this dialogue works, etc. I think that would be wonderful. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You've answered my, the, the thoughts. I think you read them, uh, the thoughts <laughs> running in my mind. Thank you so much. Jayashree, I wanted to uh, talk about the first translation ever. Uh, your like uh, you translated diary for Malayali Madman. It was uncommissioned, right? You translated yeah. during a, a tough time in your life. Yeah. Yeah. How did that come about? Like uh, when I'm feeling uh, some, I, I just write, I scribble, I go on scribbling, and uh, but how does how did translating something uh, come to your mind? 
Um, so I have translated stuff before, like poetry and short stories, single ones, you know, like um, when people are bringing out an anthology, for example, they might ask me to translate a piece here and there. Um, but the title story in that book, Diary of a Malayali Madman, the last one, in Malayalam, it came out of, as a tiny little book uh, on its own. Um, so this was, my dad passed away and I was at home for a long time. And there was a lot of like paperwork, as you know, to do and you going from, and we had a school that we were selling and, you know, so this, I, I was spending a lot of time in various government offices where people will say, okay, I'll see you at 11. And then you're sitting there till three in the afternoon, etc. So I was just, and I read this book, um, which I absolutely loved. But I just started scribbling in a notebook while waiting to see people, et cetera. I think the, the, that helped because it gave me something to engage my mind, um, but something that I like doing, um, et cetera. So that's how it happened. So I finished that first novella, which is the last one in the book, and send it to N. Prabhagaran. Um, and he liked it. But then there was this issue around, you know, English publishers don't usually publish a tiny little book on its own. Um, and with my, in, um, like from my other work, you know that I'm interested in um, this human experience that we all call madness. Um, so I, you know, Prabhakar and Masha and I together chose a few other novellas, which also had the kind of theme that explored the psychology of minds of not just you know the people who are supposedly mad but also even the people who are looking after him or the society that's mad i suppose so and then yeah so then i did them and just randomly sent an email to an editor in harper collins and he liked it so here we are so <laughs> and, uh, what's funny in pigman uh... Pigman is written as it's translated, someone translated from English to <laughs> Malayalam yeah. and you translated it back to English. Yeah. So yeah. I found that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, that that's, yeah, that's the reason for choosing all those five novellas um, is that they're all written either like a in diary form or somebody scribbling in a notebook. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a, something about the form of the stories that appeal to me as well. Um, because I'm quite interested in autobiography and not, not just life writing as it were, but, you know, the idea of how do you write the self, you know, uh, and so. Uh, well, almost all of the stories, I've got one, uh, I haven't read uh, Invisible Forest, but uh, all, all of the other stories have disjointed pieces, which when you look at it as a yeah. whole, it, that completes the picture, right? Otherwise, it's just this piece, this piece, this yeah. piece in one yeah. person's life. Yeah. So, you know, diary is written as a diary. And, you know, yeah. the, the uh, Agi, the character is, I don't know how to make sense of him. I don't think I still know. <laughs> um, but, you know, he's, it's almost like he just wanders around with this great insight into normal, ordinary life that happens around him, right? Um, and uh, yeah, Invisible Forest, that's interesting because that's the only one which has a female protagonist. It's, it, it's a woman who tells the story. Um, um, the rest of them are all men as well. Yeah. One of the reasons why I'm kind of, you know, doing some women writing right now. But it's interesting that Invisible Forest is, is almost like a little seed of Theur Chronicles. Theur Chronicles, the more kind of grander narration of similar themes. Yeah. So of you know people disappearing or taking their own lives as it were but but in you know talking about a society or the politics of that society where people end up doing these things etc so yeah something about the form of those five novellas appealed to me as well that poor guy Agi gets beaten up so much <laughs> it is very true <laughs> this whole thing you... about mob justice or yeah. what the mob thinks is justice is so common, especially these days. So, you know, like just setting up on somebody vulnerable seems to, you know, yeah. kind of again, it's, it's, I think it's, it says a lot about 
how power and how what people think power works in society, in our societies, doesn't it? And and the way you've written that too, right? Uh, <laughs> there's a colon. I got beaten up badly. It's I don't know if it's funny in Malaysia. <laughs> it's I laughed out loud at that. But uh, in in one of the interviews, you said that people always talk about what's lost in translation, but they don't talk about what's gained in translation. So, do you have something? Uh, what do you, what did you think about? Uh, does it change somewhere? Um, I think I think okay. Um, so we read Murakami. Um, not. Many of us think about what's lost in translation while we read Murakami. Why is that? While when we read translation from India's regional literature, somehow we are co constantly thinking about, I wonder what's gone here, right? So this is what got me thinking is that what allows Peter Gabriel, sorry, P Philip Gabriel to You know, what is what is that makes his translation fine for us while from our own languages, whether it is from Malayalam or Hindi or Gujarati or whatever, as readers, um, we are kind of almost trying to think, okay, something must be lost here. And something, you know, sometimes some things are lost. And uh, you know, let's let's face it. But we never stop to think about what might be gained in translation. You know, first of all, first thing that is gained is a new book to read, right? I mean, that's a very practical thing, which you would not know otherwise, or which you would not get a chance to read otherwise. But the more you read translated work, I think as readers, the more we get attuned to picking up whether a translation has worked or not worked. So, but if you are going to read a translation by, from the point, from the position of thinking that, I wonder what it is in the original, you know, what it, you know, is something lost here, et cetera, then we're never going to actually get into the spirit of the translation. But I think what, what as a reader of, or an avid reader of translations, I just read the, the book, you know, and the book will tell you as you read, whether it's a translation that's worked or, I'm not even saying good or bad, I'm just saying whether a translation works or it doesn't work because, as you read it, you will get it just like you would read a, um, a book in an original language, whether the story's worked or not. I think that's that's it really. Because um, recently I watched a video where Jerry Pinto was talking about translation and he said something to the effect, not his exact words perhaps, that translators are boatmen who take people from pilgrims from this side to that side um and not you know so so the, he he really believes that there is there is a there is a need for translators to rein themselves in or keep themselves in check because you don't you don't want too much of you in the book etc which i agree but i also think that it's bound to happen you know a translator is bound to insinuate herself into the book at various points because as writers it's impossible not to do that and i also think that perhaps we are a bit more than the rower of the boat we might also be guides to show you around the temple i don't know so you know it's kind of there is something that happens in the translation i just don't think it's helpful to talk about it only in terms of a loss I think we also need to talk about in terms of, or just don't talk about that at all. Just read the book, you know, just then decide. You, in one interview, you said that you you grew up reading translations from Gujarati, Marathi, and so do you believe the English is a conduit for someone to translate it to another, another language, or another regional language too? Mm -hmm. Uh, get it across more. Oh, um, so the so Kerala has a quite a strong history of publishing um, regional literature in Malayalam. Yeah, 
Um, and when I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, when I was growing up, these would be serialized in these literary weeklies, etc. And then perhaps also come out as a book later on. And most of what I read was translated from whichever original language it was directly into Malayalam without the English intermediary, um, which still happens. Um, so I'm not sure English is necessary for that, but I don't know. I mean, some I read somewhere somebody commenting that, and I have no um, evidence of any kind to agree or disagree that, that um, there are less and less bilingual people in India and, you know, in the sense of not English, but, you know, people who speak Gujarati and Bengali, perhaps, or Malayalam and Kannada, perhaps, you know, so I don't know about that. But I think, I think there's still some translations happening. I mean, Misha is being translated into Tamil without the help of Ustash right now, uh, you know, so from Malayalam directly to Tamil. Directly. Yeah. So I, I don't think English is necessary. As long as you know we have enough people working to bridge languages and literatures together. Yeah, Neil had a question. Neil, go ahead. Neil is has worked on uh, a Gujarati to English translation of his right. of his own. So please go ahead, Neil. You're on mute right now. Thank you so much. So uh, your words have been really inspiring. That. Uh, uh, I uh, it's motivating to know that you know you also feel that uh, it's difficult to or an author or a translator can probably insert some parts of themselves into a translation and uh, that translators are more than uh, just you know people taking uh, taking a reader from one bank to another because uh, I mean, one of the tough choices, which when I do translation, I have to make is it's a very serious time commitment. So do I write my own thoughts or do I translate? And uh, I mean, the way I feel is that probably a translator is somebody who is, you know, adopting somebody else's kid okay. while their parents are still alive, you know, because the author is still the final authority on your book and you are still sort of adopting that kid and bringing it up because you feel that, you know, it, it deserves a wider audience. So uh, uh, thank you so much for your words and uh, what you've shared. Uh, what, uh, uh, I was just curious. Uh, so while reading Mushtash, I, I found it very, uh, uh, in a way, I, I would say that if an author would have written directly in English, I mean, this is my own opinion, uh, but if an author in a regional language would have written directly in English, they, they would have probably come up with this. So uh, I felt it, I mean, I could connect to it. Okay. I, uh, I felt it had that feel of the place, which it was, uh, you know, uh, it was taking me to. And uh, so, I mean, did, did you ever have to uh, go through any situations while translating that there would be probably one word and instead of that one word, you had to write probably a lot more for reader to get there or uh, uh, any such antidotes that you'd like to share? Definitely. I mean, I can't think immediately of something. But there are places where I think there is, ha, huh, um, I don't know if you remember, there is a scene where when the, the bund of the fields are breaking and water coming in, there are these, these masters of the field who catch hold of the, the person who looks after the field, plies him with alcohol and then uses him to, to to rebuild the bun, right? Um, in that chapter, because uh, there was a, there was a saying in Malayalam which was there that was used. His name is Akan in the book, um, and that this is where, well, in English, you know, to, you had to say this is where Akan was sacrificed and became a deity of the fields or whatever else. Whereas in Malayalam, it was just this one 
phrase. Um, so there are things like that where you can't really use that one phrase um, and you might need, and there are many places in mustache where there is extra sentences, not paragraphs, but um, I try and keep them in terms of using the Malayalam word and then kind of having a short explanation between two hyphens or, you know, so you can actually see where that is happening. That that definitely will happen because you're never going to find equivalence or, and sometimes you can leave it because you get the meaning from the context, but in some places you need an extra something for people to understand what's going on, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, again, we'd like to say that I really enjoyed Mustache. If it would not be for a translation, I would have not known it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I believe Swati has a question. Uh, Jashi Swati is also one of our organizers. She has a uh, children's book that has been translated into five languages. Oh, wow. Nine languages. Yeah. Nine languages. Oh, yeah. wonderful. Um, and it's not exactly touched your topic, but uh, kind of one of my books is uh, has various mental things <laughs> in it also. Okay. Mm -hmm. in it. Um, but uh, I was wondering how, how has translation changed you? Because just reading a translation is very different from delving into the depth of what is the author trying to say and actually entering their mind in such depth and then trying to translate it. How has it changed you as a person? And I was wondering, is it an exercise that all of us should do with something short perhaps, but you know, for Indian writers, we, if you know how to read your mother tongue, then is it something we should all pursue? I think everybody should, if you can write um, and read in two languages, I think you should try and bridge them together um, because that just connects more people, you know, allows us to see more cultures, more places, more into other people's heads, which I enjoy doing. Um, okay, to, to answer your first question, I don't know, sometimes I feel that it's the kind of person that I am that makes me a translator rather than the other way around, because I like finding out stuff more and more. I like to go after things. I mean, even for simple thing, like if I'm watching Fear of the Walking Dead and I see something and I have to go and look up the actor and read all about his biography and what else he's done and, you know, kind of, um, and then go on a, like a, I like rabbit holes to go down. Um, in terms of reading, I, you know, I do the same thing. You know, I, I like looking things up and I like, you know, kind of getting into the nitty gritty of things. I mean, mustache, it was hard work, but the research was just so enjoyable because, you know, there is stuff that I was reading that I wouldn't otherwise have read. Like, for example, how does a tower clock work? Or how does the, the irrigation system, which is called Petty and Para, that is used widely in, you know, you. To, used to be used widely um, in Kerala. And how, how does how does how does that actually work? And what are the different bits called? You know, etc. And so, I mean, it it it. Um, mm -hmm. I think it suits my personality <laughs> that that likes to dig into things. Um, but you're right also that you know maybe being a translator, being a translator definitely makes you a a, a better reader. I think. Um, even when you're reading um, books that are not, that you're not um, wanting to translate, but it just, I have found myself paying more attention to books in terms of not just the story, but you know, how people write, you know, even in terms of how does this dialogue unfold, you know, some people like Marilyn Robinson is brilliant dialogue writer, you know, I've read her books all the while and I recently I was rereading one of the ones and then, you know, sort of, paying more attention to because also because I personally think that I'm very bad at writing dialogue um, and so you know kind of you pay more attention to reading I think yeah. so, this, on the theme of cha changing yours does it change you as a person 
does it change your relationship with the original language translating a piece if you are translating a malayalam piece does it change your relationship with malayalam in in some way uh, i think it does because i think i know malayalam a bit better now than you know as a translator than before but also because i think it's also circumstances because i used to write in malayalam um and then and and read quite a lot but then there was like a long period of where i did not write malayalam at all um and it was it's only in the last 5 years that i again started writing in malayalam and even the reading had gone down a bit and you know and now it's you know kind of picking up more but definitely you know the comfort with language because the partly it is because you know i'm here i don't i mean even my husband doesn't speak malayalam so i don't have anybody to speak the language with except when i call home every sunday with my mom um and when you don't speak when you don't read enough and when you don't write i think you lose that that i guess you still know the language but you, you know you lose something of the language and i think translating has definitely um brought my comfort with malayalam back quite a bit i won't say all of it but a lot of it not enough to write in malayalam yet but you know yeah sini do you have a question oh uh, yeah i had a question now i was also reading uh, murakami actually men and women and when you were mentioning the philip uh, the translator philip's name i just realized i had the book right here and uh, in mustache your name is given in the front in the on the cover page itself which is a great thing and i realized that even on kafka on the show or even on uh, men without women they have not mentioned the translator's name at all on the front cover the zer inside after you mentioned i when i opened the book and read it and then i found out the name otherwise i didn't have philip uh, Flynn Gabriel's name at all till now, and I was reading both these books, Kafka on the show, T uh, show, and uh, Men Without Women, and I had no idea that, about the name of the translator. And so thank you so much for that. <laughs> and I think they should have um, printed the translator's name also on the front cover, just like you you have your name. So I think that's really a great thing for translators. And uh, my one question was uh, when I started. reading i started reading mustache first i got mustache first so there were a couple of places which i had marked which i was curious about how it will get translated in the english version so uh, one such place is um, sorry it is when uh, vavachan and pavian are meeting sita for the first time and uh, pavian curses at her so in the english version it is written um she is more co- uh, coarser than her mother but whereas when i read the malayalam version i had a jolt because it is a you know a really bad curse word that uh, he is using and uh, quite freq- uh, quite uh, lately now because there is a lot of um, because of social media and everything then there are a lot of uh, um people like reema kalingal and all who get trolled a lot on uh, social media for their posts and so this word is like something that i have come across in all those uh, trolling messages and the comments that they uh, bombard ladies especially to bring them down when they are vocal when they you know when they have um, when they feel that the women are raising their voice against anything any issue whatever so this word this curse word which is there in the original misha in the original misha it is written that our covered um, mai kalum kadi kudal aanu and all that so i was wondering why you chose to you know you go gentle on that curse word in the english version this is a very interesting question because i agonized over the curse words obscenities in the book not necessarily because see, see i curse like a you know i curse all the time i use bad language i have no qualms with that but because a lot of the curse words we have in malayalam have caste based origins um this is something i discovered while in the research 
of doing mustache. I also discovered there is a dictionary of swear words in English, by the way, if people are interested. Um, um, so there are places where you couldn't replace a word like karuveri or karuveridam okay, with scoundrel or something. And so finding out that, especially in a book like Mustache, a lot of the Malayalam swear words that all of us Malayalis use or take for granted as we know have very, very caste-based origins. It isn't so in English. In English, a lot of swear words have biblical origins or what's said in the Bible, etc. cetera. So, th so there was a bit of time when I agonized as to how do I deal with it. And then what I've done in the book is to kind of sort of pick and choose freely from the known English swear words because there was, in, there was, there was very little I could do to you know, otherwise bring that complexity of, not complexity because the history of swear words, I think. I couldn't bring that to the book. I don't know if Harish intended to bring it in the book, into the book or he was just you know, using the swear words that were common in Malayalam. So there are places where you know, the English equivalent that I might have found fits the work, it might have kind of mellowed it a bit, but there are also places where it hasn't. I don't know. I think I did a free choice of words rather than, you know, be exact, I think. Yeah. Going back to yeah, what you uh, said about the translator's could... name, etc., if I may, on the book. Yeah. I think I think. I think I think a part of that has to do with the publishers. Um, so some publishers like HarperCollins are, you know, they put the translator's name on the cover of all of the translation books that they publish, whereas there are others who don't. Um, and there are translators who insist um, and translators who are okay not having it. I think it, it depends on where you come from. For me, translation or literary translation as a field um, and how translators are treated by the publishing industry is a political issue for me um, because a lot of the time translators are taken advantage of unless you become a very, you know, well-known um, Grigory Rabasa or Philip Gabriel or whoever. I mean, even Grig Grigory Rabasa talks about not receiving royalties for various books that he's done, etc. So, yeah, so th there is that. And I think it is also incumbent on us as readers that, or at least it'll be good if as readers we remember the people who rode the boat for us to bring us from one side to the other. So. Uh, in Mustache, I, I wanted to ask this. In Mustache, there's a, there are two distinct parts, right? Where the author character talks to, uh, it's, talk to talks to his son, and the and the spirit uh, and the uh, story set in. Mm -hmm. early 1900s or something yeah uh, how do you deal with language change there uh, there's a distinct shift in the language too i don't know if it's uh, that apparent in malayalam but in english it uh, it is very evident when you that the tone changes somehow yeah how do you deal with that it it is it is quite apparent in malayalam as well i would say won't you sini what do you think Yes, yes, very evident. It is, uh, yeah. Harish, uh, when he's talking about uh, the thoughts with his son, it is very light. It's a very light approach. And the other places, it's like a little more heavy in the, uh, Malayalam words. And also, you know, when in those places where the father is talking to the son, um, it's more of your everyday contemporary Malayalam. Whereas in other parts, there are usages and, and kind of, and the other parts are also more poetic even, you know, in this, and there's some chapters again, which has a completely different, like uh, my favorite chapter is Chella, that chapter about Vavachan's mother. 
um, you know, the language is very, very different there as well. So there's, there's a few different languages, but those parts are very much written in a very contemporary Malayalam. So in English also, you could, you know, you could just essentially follow the tone and music and tonality of the author. And then, so I think it reflects then in translation. In also uh, speaking of music, the, there's a certain musicality rhythm to a uh, regional Indian language, right? But in your translator's note, you said you, you don't actually try to replicate it, uh, but uh, make it something of its own. How do you, what's the process of doing that? Because how do you, do you ignore the musicality or try to somewhere weave in that? Uh, no, not at all. I, I think I think there are two things that perhaps that you are in the in the introduction. I speak about. I don't know if I speak about that. Anyway, musicality is important. Um, you know because that's that 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 gives you a guide as to how you would, what you would choose, what words you would choose, how you would phrase a sentence, etc. What I don't agonize about is whether dialect or culture. Kind of, you know, I don't agonize about that because I think that if you follow the story and the author's voice and the rest comes with it. So one of the one of the things that is most difficult to do is to replicate dialect. So in, even in, in the original Misha, there are places where when especially in dialogue, when people are speaking to each other, there, are, there is a certain dialect that you can do one of two things or probably main um, other things but mainly one of two things one is that you can follow the music of the sentence and try and translate or you can try and find some kind of patois some kind of dialect of english and then try and use that this would not work for mustache this would not have worked for mustache that you know sort of try and you know say those things in cockney or in you know in mancunian english would not have worked for mustache but it's not you know it's not as obvious as it is in malayalam that certain dialect differences are there in english it is not because i just wasn't able to figure out how to do that unless you bring in this you know kind of to me what sounds artificial dialect imposition so all then you can do is follow the musicality so I, I follow the music it is i don't try and agonize over dialect i don't try and agonize because one of the questions people always ask is how do you translate culture and my answer always has been that if you follow the story and the author's voice i think the culture comes with it rather than agonizing or will this will the english reader understand this etc then it probably just draws you away from the story and how the story is told i think but if you follow the the direction of the story my personal feeling is that culture comes with it kenjal do did you have a question yeah, um, Jeshi, ma'am just answered what I had, but uh, mustache has such an expanse of time. There's, you know, there's a mythological undercurrent. You know that there is a political undercurrent, and uh, you get a hint of it, like you dip your toes in it when you're reading it in English and you're reading mustache. But uh, so I wanted to know, like, the kind of research, the kind of process that went into translating that context the subtext and the context of Nisha into English. So did you have a process in it or was it very organic? So if you can... Um, so some of it is organic and some of it, I have a living author who I can ask. Yeah. So if I'm stuck, I can say, Harish, what did you mean here? I know what's this about and he will, you know, sort of tell me where he came up with that, etc. Um, so, but also, you know, um, there are parts in Mustache where uh, uh, what might have been obvious to a Malayali reader uh, may not have been obvious to the person reading it in English. Having said that, there are bits in Mustache that wasn't obvious to me as a Malayali reader, unless Harish told me this is what I meant, you know, so, 
um, for example, there is, do you remember towards the end of the book, um, a, another mustache comes, whose name is Narayanan, yeah? And those chapters have a lot of references to stories to Mahabharata and Ramayana, especially Ramayana, I think. Um, so Harish told me that he had Jadhayu in mind when he was thinking about this character, which is not something I had uh, picked up at all from reading the Malayalam book. And to me, it wasn't obvious. But the moment he said it, it kind of became obvious because there's something about him, which is, you know, the, the, the persuasion that is happening you know, to get Mustache to go and join the, the you know, the, the fight against the British that was happening and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so there are places like that where, you know, having a living author helps um, so that we can ask. But mostly it is an organic process uh, because, you know, you could put a footnote or a glossary in there saying that, you know, this is what was meant here, etc. right? Um, which probably if anybody, any literature students study mustache in class, they might do as their class assignment. But for us, as, as a translator, I think, you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, like I said, you, if you stick to the story and think about the story, understand the story, the many layers of the story, then I think it, there are ways in which you can try and bring that into the translation. I mean, throughout, I mean, yes, Sita is called Sita. And there is the, you know, the, the, the love and the abuse towards Sita from Vavachan's side, which in itself makes him Sri Ram, right? Um, you know, th so there are all those kind of different levels that are at play. Um, Can you share some experience about collaborating with the author when, when you're translating? Like, what is that nature of collaboration? When does it begin? Uh, does it begin after the first draft of your translation or is it an ongoing intermediate process? Um, so, like I said, with the Prabhakaran Marsh's novels, um, which is the diary and the latest one, the Your Chronicles. Um, so, like I said, diary, the, the title story in it, I had just translated um, on my own. And I didn't know Marsh at that time, uh, you know. And then I contacted him and then I went to visit him. Um, so, in that first visit, we had a very long chat, essentially about his writing and my reading and, you know, about the various stuff of his that I had read and you know also thinking about so it's not about the book that you're translating but you are kind of having a conversation with him as a writer etc and meeting him and you know getting to know him that definitely helps I think um in in practical terms like I said there are you know having them and the next books that I'm working on are all of contemporary authors um you know, you can, you can, I mean, Harish and I, we only met in person in April this year. Um, but we, we kind of, we became very close friends, but that's over WhatsApp, you know, so I would just WhatsApp him something if there's a question and he would um, respond. But when I, where he read it was that when I was, when I sent him the first draft, which for me is third or fourth draft, you know? So like for him, it's the first draft. And even then, you know, he would just send me stuff like in chapter one, you know, so usually what he picks up is where there's a mistake in something or something has been missed out. Never have either of the authors that I've, you know, worked with and published so far sort of said to me that you must change this into something different or anything. Um, because I think both of them kind of look at translation as a process of creative work, as a creative work as well, rather than just kind of rendering from one language to the other. So, so far, no, you know, neither of them have, but they have picked up on stuff that I may have missed or, you know, like kind of in the sense that place names, um, people's names um, or relationship between people, things that you miss out um, or make a mistake on, both of them have helped. Where Harish helped immensely was 
In Mustache, there is a chapter that's full of folk songs. Um, so I agonized forever trying to translate that because somebody talked about the tune um, in your head when you're reading something, right? And I'm reading these folk songs in a kind of, and in my head, they are, in a Malayalam tune, you know, in a, in a Kerala tune of folk songs. And when I'm trying to translate that into English, I'm trying to write English in that tune, which simply wasn't working. And I was desperate by that time because what am I going to do with this? You know, because this tune is not getting out of my head and, uh, you know, it's just not happening. So I had a conversation with Harish and he said to me that, look, these are not my songs. These are folk songs. These are part of an oral tradition that people sing differently in different parts. These don't belong to me. Why not sing it differently in English as well? You know, there is no reason to stick to the folk song because by nature of a folk song, there is no one rendition of it. There are many renditions of it. So that kind of released something. And then I was able to translate that. Although I still think that is probably the, 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 the weakest chapter in the book. Um, but yeah, you know, so this kind of dialogue with authors really help, I think. We talked about these two authors, right? Uh, Harish and Prabhakaran. Uh, I, I wanted to ask, what, is, uh, what was the experience? You said uh, in our chats, you had different experience, totally different experiences translating uh, Prabhakaran's books versus Harish's books. What was something that stood out to you while translating both of these authors? The differences, I mean. Um, they, I mean, very simply, they are different kinds of writers. Um, Prabhakaran um, has written many books, novels, short stories, poetry, travelogue, plays, all of it, you know, different genres as well, and many books. And he also has, in himself, he has different styles of writing as well. And there is a certain style of his writing that I like very much, which is the kind of um, stories in the novel that he's written. But his is a, I don't know how to put it. I mean, he's a different kind of writer from Harish. Um, so as a translator, when you engage with the books, it's also a written kind of, you know, I think I tend to be more introspective when I write, when I translate Prabhakaran's books, whereas Harish's book is a ride, you know, it's, 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 it's a different ride. And I've just finished translating a collection of Harish's short stories, including the story that became the film Jallikattu. Um, and you know, if you've seen the film, you know that it's a ride. It's, it's of course Lijo's interpretation of that story. But you know, there's there's a different tempo, there's a different temperament to the stories. And I think I I also go into like different mind spaces. I think I don't know quite how to explain more than that, to be honest. Hey, because uh, even though it's you translated both of these books that I've read, there there is. You can see the author's voice shine through it, it uh, but it, it also has some of your touches. Uh, mostly in, in the initial chapters of uh, Diary, in the, in the first couple of stories, I, I felt in, uh, in, in Mustache, mostly I felt that you just gave a word and don't try to translate it. But in uh, Diary, in, in the first, uh, in Wild Goat, I think, that you tr you try somewhere to explain to a, a foreign reader. Maybe that's that's the feeling I got. Maybe I don't know. Oh, it, it probably is true because you know, a diary is my first book of translation. I'm still learning. I'm still kind of developing. You know, my own voice or method of translation. So there might be that. Um, I don't know. I just. It could be, definitely. Uh, I don't have a question. Sorry, go ahead. And I'm just saying maybe the third book will probably have even less explanation. I hope not. But, you know, like, <laughs> you know, you want the English reader to make 
sense of the book as well, isn't it? There's also a factor of trusting the reader, right? In Mustache, you trust. Yeah. I felt that you trusted uh, the reader a lot more. He he'll understand from the context <laughs> at least, even if he doesn't yeah. know. If he doesn't know the the geography, uh, the people, the culture, you trust mm. the reader to to infer from the context. That's what I felt while reading Mustache. Okay, and that that's very interesting. But I think I think it is it is possible because you know you you're also kind of I think as a translator you're also has the more you translate you also get a sense of how to do it better or differently, etc. That that. That could be it. All I can say is, that. I don't know. Ma, I'm just wondering whether it has to do with specificity, the kind and the degree of specificity in the original work. Like because mustache is so intricately detailed, then you can you can trust that the reader will get from context some of the things that you don't translate. Is is yeah. does that work? Yeah, I see. Like I said. Um, the only thing I'm really consciously doing, and the, the thing that I'm doing most consciously or trying to do most consciously as a translator is to follow the original, its its story and its style of telling story and its tonality, etc. So obviously there's going to be, I think, that, I mean, I hope then that reflects into the translation as well. Um, the stories in diary are also very different in terms of as as narrative they're very different from mustache isn't it you know like the, um so i don't know it just i still think that part of it is to do with how you are learning as you do every book you know there's so much learning that you're doing while you're working on new things so that definitely would be part of it as well also, well, most of the stories are set in the contemporary era, yeah. in, in diary, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the language needs to change as well for that, isn't it? It's like talking about the chapters in 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 Mustache, which is at the contemporary uh, time. So, there's if you read Tiur, which is set, a lot of it is set in history. Even though it is by the same author as Prabha, as Prabhagaran is the author of both there is a shift in language um especially there are chapters like the first chapter for example etc which is just quite a different tone to propagand's own language from these novelas in diary so you know hopefully that will reflect in the translation as well arun had a question thank you sir uh Jeshri, i'm in the process of uh, translating uh, Marathi short stories in Bengali. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mara I, sorry, Marathi into Bengali. Yes, okay. Marathi short stories. In, yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, what I find is, uh, and I'm lucky. I'm in Maharashtra, in Pune, and uh, and uh, I know a bit of Bengal because I was born there. So uh, uh, I I quite enjoy the difference in the you know between these two languages quite enjoy it. and uh, there is just some kind of i know i find a certain humor in marathi language and the way you know it's, it's expressed i enjoy quite a bit but there is not much of equivalent that there in bengal you know in bengali bengal so when, while i was translating uh, uh, my first uh, first short story i, I had help uh, what I found is that there are mannerisms, there are dialects that I cannot, I cannot translate in uh, Bengali, uh, no matter how much I try. There is no equivalent. So uh, I was disturbed by it because mm. I wanted to be as, you know, I, I want the story to be as authentic as possible. So what I did, I kind of compromised. I, I rather focused on the plot and focused on that, how the characters are and how they're going toward that finality at the end. It's a short story, so there is a punch at the end. So uh, I did that, but I felt that, you know, it's not proper. Uh, what I enjoy here uh, when I'm uh, listening to uh, others talking and the varieties of the language here, uh, if I could have uh, 
transfer that some way, it would have been nice, but I couldn't do it. Is there a way? You know what? I would love to organize a meeting with some of the wonderful translators that we have in India at the moment just to talk about dialect. You know, because I think that is probably the most uh, difficult and controversial um, part of being a translator. <laughs> um, Jerry Pinto said, and, uh, he interviewed me a while ago, and um, I, he said something about it in that interview where, I can't remember exactly, but there was, there was some um, part of dialect that, you know, thinking about how to translate dialect and then he try and, and then you try and use English in a different way and then you get accused for using bad English you know <laughs> because and then you, because you also in that process you're also trying to make characters talk as if they don't know the you know because in, even if it is mustache the characters are talking in English and you don't want to make some characters talk you know, like they don't know English or they're, you know, bad English or whatever. So there, there, there is that. Or the other thing that, I, like I said earlier, is that, you know, you try and find these like weird dialects that don't really fit with the story or the context of the story or the time of the story or the, or the personality of the character that you pull out from somewhere else, etc. How this works in regional language, my, you know, that's not something I have uh, personal experience of doing, but I, I would imagine there are similar, because let's face it, language, dialects, uh, or, or stuff that we call dialects, because some are called languages and some are called dialects. Like, as I said earlier, these are all inflected by class, gender, caste, etc. Because, you know, you have to be a certain kind of person for your language to be taken as the standard and the rest of the peoples are dialects, etc. Right. So I think all you can do really, uh, what you said at the end struck me. You had this, as a reader, you enjoyed the Marathi original for a particular reason. I would say that if you get to that point where you read the Bengali translation and you enjoy it, the translation has worked. So, you know, that's where you probably need to focus on, you know, kind of work on it to see what kind of Bengali would these characters speak and not worry too much about dialect per se, but you're thinking about how will these characters speak in Bengali? And then once you get to a point where you're reading your Bengali translation and you get the enjoyment, then that works, isn't it? Because there is no other, you know, sort of solution to it. You just have to, to work at it. And especially for me personally, if it is, in the form of dialogue that the dialect becomes an issue. For me, that's even more difficult because as it is, I find writing dialogue very difficult. Um, and then to have, you know, make, to make characters speak in different dialects, et cetera, is even more difficult for me personally. But I think just keep working at it to get to a point of Bengali that you think works without really focusing on this is dialect and and Bengali doesn't have such a dialect. Don't focus on that, but think about how characters would behave in Bengali. Yes, I mean, that is what I'm hoping to do, that you know, I write an uh, interesting, entertaining Bengali short story at the end. Of course, it, it is a translation, but still, and that is what I'm doing it, but uh, I'm little, uh, a little sad that you know, my Bengali readers will not, will not be able to enjoy this one i have one another one okay and it's not really a story probably an observation but uh, uh, it is important so uh, i wrote a short story in english uh, that is uh, that happens in pune and uh, uh, so they're maharashtrian people and so it's in english so i'm trying to follow the, the thought process the way we think here and we're trying to and of course it's not a very neat english you know neat english the way even even the way noipal writes or the way you know neat english like you know Nabokov writes or you know other people who writes very well in english it's not a very straightforward english so it's a little convoluted a little you know and it's not a very even a proper english sometimes and i was reading this to uh, a few writers who are from america and uh, britain and uh, they were they were 
I mean, they were they were nice to me, but uh, I can see that you know they thought that that English is you know unclean. It's not. It's not. Very, mm -hmm. you know, it's not very good, and uh, uh, they thought uh, the fault is with me. And uh, of course, the fault is with me because I'm not that a great writer. But the point here is that you know how do I how do I how do I represent that? And when I was reading, you know, when I was reading Mushtaz, you know, in the beginning, it was hard for me because, of course, right, by reading those American writers or those famous American writers or the you know, British writers, I got used to of certain sentence structures, you know, these mm. are the you know, plain sentences. Mm. This is not, this is not that, that way. But of course, after sometimes I get used to it and it was easier. And of course, uh, yours, your translation is far more, you know, representative of that, uh, that, uh, the language that you have translated. So, what do you think about it? And uh, what I what I, what I'm trying to say probably is that how have you found that the confidence that okay, I'm going to write like this, the translation will be like this. Maybe it will not be as clean as I could have made it, but I'm not going to make it. Hmm. We we suppose we talked a little bit about it earlier, but I think I want to start by saying that I think as writers, as Indian writers writing in whichever, especially if you're writing in English or translating into English, we need to get out of the habit of thinking of certain Englishes as not clean, proper, etc. Right. There are many Englishes in this world. It's not, there isn't just one standard universal English. There are writers who write in English, Ngogi Wat Yongo's name comes to mind, who very consciously writes in the English that he speaks in his country, in Africa, right? And there are many such writers who do that. Um, the um, Bernardine Everiste last year, was it, or the year before, shared the prize with Margaret um, Atwood. She writes in an English that is very representative of Black British people living in the UK. So there are many Englishes. Um, the first thing I would say, if you don't do it already, is to read widely of other Englishes rather than just the white American English and white American sort of cisgendered male mostly writing. Um, there are other Englishes that we can read. So reading them is one way of you know, understanding how language works in different ways. Um, as to your own story, if your characters will speak that English, then that's your English, right? It's not about, you know, you can't take a character from one setting and situation and then make that character speak like he is in Cambridge in the halls of one of the colleges, right? So it has the language. We would do the same thing in, in, in regional language when we're writing in our own language. So it's it's about I think there is there is this thing that the very first thing to understand is that it, there isn't just one language is always shifting, always changing, and language is what we as human beings make it to be, and we all make it very differently in different places. Um, somebody asked me about mustache. Um, why didn't you use Indian English? So that I thought that was a very interesting question because you know it it didn't occur to me at all to kind of you know sort of do that thing that you do in indian english and you know sort of translate using that language i think the reason for that is when for me personally coming from kerala when people say indian english two things come to mind one is the english as is spoken in delhi bombay uh, pune etc by people who are english educated by people who are kind of you know metropolitan etc that simply would not have fitted mustache. 
The second is the kind of colonial English of reports and sort of governmentality, which you will see there is in one of the chapters um, when there's a man writing a report. And, you know, purposely, I, I remember in the first draft that my editor had come back with lots of punctuations in that report and i said no we need to remove all these fun punctuations because the whole point is how he makes these sentences as knotted as the canals in the region right you know he just goes on and on with nobody understands what's being said and there is there is a particular way of i mean even if you understand what is being said there's a particular you know colonial way of usage of english so for me when people say indian english these are the two things because i don't know and i don't know if sini will agree with me in Kerala, where I grew up, I can't think of what Indian English is. We have a Kerala way of speaking English, which is still in my accent even, but we don't have what, what we understand as Indian English. And these two kind types of Englishes that I associated with Indian English would not have fitted mustache. So what you do is to find the language that fits the story and the characters and the context in which they are. Um, and and it will work if you do that. But just in our own story, uh, these people are talking in Marathi in in the. But we as writers, we we are translating it into English while we are writing it. So it's a choice that the writer makes, right? We, where do you set? <laughs> do you uh, how how sanitize or Cambridge language? you make it and I, I don't know I, I don't really know the yeah uh, yeah so it, it's a, it, it's a choice that every writer makes you know there is no reason why a story as Arun's cannot use language like Faulkner you know would that suit the story is something that Arun as a writer needs to decide what I'm trying to say is that if if Arun instead chose to, you know, use a different kind of English for those characters, as long as you feel that it works for the story and the characters, then that's it. Because as a writer, each of us make those choices. The only point I'm pressing here is not to think of certain Englishes as not proper or not clean, etc because there are many different varieties of English and people writing in many different varieties of English. To get familiar with that is, you know, kind of read different Englishes, written in different Englishes. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Does anybody have any question? We are winding down the session now. So if you have a question, please ask. I have a question. <laughs> So are there any translators amongst you other than Swati and Arun is um, trying and also Neil, who was Neil, that? Neil yes, was yeah. translated into Gujarati yeah. language. Or with interest in translating. We also spoke about the Hindi, you know, Sindhi one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't translate. My book was translated, but I, okay. I don't translate myself. Okay. I'm getting. I just. I'm getting, I just yes. Oh, Sorry, Sini. Go yeah, ahead. Please. Please, yeah. No, no. Please go ahead, please. I just wanted to uh, tell her, uh, tell uh, Jayshree that um, when I was reading Nisha, I realized that the uh, author's note of Nisha, what Harish has written about it, is different from the mustache's uh, author's note. Because in Mustache, he's giving a brief introduction about Kutanad and everything. So I just wanted to share it with uh, the Pune writers group. So I translated the author's note of Misha in, uh, into English for them. So that is the first translation I've done in my life was, uh, from Malayalam to English. Okay. Yeah. That was yeah, an we, interesting experience. Yeah. We, we, did, we did discuss that because, you know, given how you know we discussed some of these things already given how complex a book mustache is there was a lot of talk about with with our editor um about glossary you know maybe not footnotes but then a glossary to explain etc and then you know like i was very adamant that we didn't want to do any of that 
but we wanted some kind, kind of context. Even the map at the beginning wasn't there in the original. You know, that is something yeah. um, a friend of mine suggested just to, you know, kind of get a feel of, you know, all the rivers flowing and, you know, kind of. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I wish it was there in the Malayalam version also. Because, uh, <laughs> even I have no, uh, I don't know about uh, most of the rivers. I know about Amina Chill. I just know that it is there in Kottayam because I see it every time. And I know about Pamba because it is there in Alapura. And uh, because of the, all the boat races take place in yeah. Pamba. Otherwise, I had no idea about where it is and uh, how the whole geography yeah. is. All, all yeah. So what we did is to, Harish and I together kind of sort of picked the places that we wanted to mark on the map based on the book, you know, like, because it's also Wawachin's meanderings through this region, right? You know, so it, it, it kind of gives a kind of physical context to, to our hero's travels, as it were. And then found a map and somebody in the design department kind of, you know, put it to scale, etc. So that was one thing. And the introduction was the only place, the author's introduction was the only place then to to kind of talk a little bit about the caste systems and the different castes that existed, etc. Otherwise, every time you say Pulayan, you, you know, in the glossary, you want to explaining who a Pulayan is, not the way we want it to go, but kind of just give a kind of political, social history in a very nutshell, as it were, of the, of the region. So that's very different from Malayalam uh, introduction. And also it was Harish who also, you know, sort of didn't feel that the Malayalam introduction would was what required for um, mustache. So we left that out. I don't even say something, right? Oh, I just wanted to add one more thing. Uh, I think the uh, history of all this caste system and all in Kerala would have been like very helpful. Uh, I mean, even when even I, I studied, all, all my education was done in Kerala, but I really do not have any much uh, understanding about the um, the, the history of uh, Kerala at all and whatever little I know is because of the museum visits as you know Trivandrum there was hardly any any other venues for recreation there were a lot of uh, palaces which were converted into museums and beaches mm. so that is where our parents took us to when we caused too much trouble during holidays and all so the museums in uh, Trivandrum have a lot of uh, information about the the royal family, especially the last king, Chitra Tirunal and all that, but nothing more than mm. that, those mm. things and all. So all this, um, all the, uh, the, the reformation movements and all those things and all the caste-based things and all that, we are really not even taught that in our school. So yeah. we are taught of the Indian history and the freedom struggle and all that, but we are not really taught about uh, any of these things, about the history mm. of Kerala at all. So I was discussing about all of this with my friends as uh, when I was reading Mustache and I was telling them, did you know about this? Uh, they're still living, most of them are still in Kochi and all that. And even they aren't aware. Yeah. And even their kids aren't aware. So that is the, that's the sad part. That... Yeah. So it's good that books like this are bringing it out. So we are going to be aware of it. But it's not the story's responsibility, right? right. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> answering on behalf of the essay, but it's not just a story's responsibility to educate you. You should do <laughs> research. But... Yes, that is true. But it was a, there was no other opportunity uh, to get into all these things. So it was a good window of opportunity. That is, that's true. No, definitely, it's it's it is not the story or story's responsibility to educate you. However, you can choose to educate through your story, without become without also being pedagogic. You know, I mean that that's up to the right the kind of writer you are. Like you know, a lot of feminist writers are very political in their writing, and they are educating people on various things, but not you know like you would as a mission of education, but by bringing those issues and politics into their story and addressing them in their story and there's a lot of writers who do that and some writers who don't choose choose to do that um i think i am personally drawn to books that do that are political i think every writing is political even even saying i'm not political is a political statement you know so but i i tend to get drawn to books that are making 
some kind of political commentary as well i think i also wanted to ask you jashri did you ever have any uh, you know bad experience because you were translating nisha like did any of your friends or relatives or anybody give you any uh, you know like i i remember hearing harish mentioning once that uh, his neighbor stopped talking to him so did you have any such no yeah so harish obviously as you know uh, went through quite a harrowing period because of just three chapters this is before the book came out you know it was just you know just on the third by the time he got to the third chapter he was in big trouble with you know various things obviously i, I didn't i didn't face anywhere near um anything like harish faced but i did get some um uh, response on social media uh somebody even asked me about you know how jayashree kalatil and then he put jayashree kalatil in quotation marks a person with such a name because he assumed correctly in this instance that i might be a upper caste hindu woman um um could col- you know collude in translating this book etc um but see i i i am a political activist i am not you know half the things you do are questioned by people and as long as something doesn't sit wrong with me i'm okay with you know putting myself out there there was also somebody else obviously who tried to give me this very long explanation um of the the conspiracy that's happening in in kerala about you know sort of wanting to take down certain communities etc so yeah people have given such a uh, flack it is after mustache came out and after the award uh, etc that harish misha eventually got the sahitya academy award kerala sahitya academy award for the original malayalam and then of course there was a resurgence of some of this thing and that's when a lot of people in kerala found out that this book has gone off gone on to english and actually got a different award in english because until then they hadn't even because personally i think that a lot of people who have problems with this book haven't read the book as is the case mostly when when people have a problem with books so if you have read the book and you know you have an opinion that's absolutely fine because we all have different opinions about the books we read so yeah, yeah I but nowhere bad, near us like uh when Just i started reading here yeah sorry sorry uh, tanoj had a question yeah yeah uh hi i i'm sorry i joined late although i had designed to join at 3 pm but i'm really sorry i missed it and i'll probably be catching it on the recording uh i have been trying to uh, translate some of my work like short stories in english or even in english into hindi which is another language that i can uh write in and i have written you know some articles for some short stories in hindi as well but something very very strange happens with me when i do that i end up tr- wanting to improve slash rewrite the story uh you know i i, I can't stop uh, at at just you know like with the objective of translating i end up and, and i'm not talking about you know changing how a sentence renders itself mm-hmm. Uh, i'm not talking about that i'm talking about i sometimes go to the point of wanting to change the plot itself or wanting to change significant uh, the the sequence of events in the story and I, it's frustrating because <laughs> uh, is there any hope for you know like me or, or should should i just shut it down and say my work if it it has to be translated someone else has to do it ah oh, interesting question um so So my my book the children's book uh, i wrote it in english right and it was given to somebody else to translate into malayalam first but that person <laughs> the tran- the translation was like a pressy of eight pages um mm-hmm. of this so i got really frustrated with that and so i translated it myself and I won't say I translated it exactly as it is in English because the story was the story was very sometimes I think that's the only story that I have wanted to tell and ever will tell in my life etc so the story you know it came quite freely in Malayalam as well but it's not exactly the same as in English it's 
but very close enough. So that's an interesting experience of doing your own, you know, um, work. But my feeling, and this I'm not saying this with any kind of authority, but if the story is behaving differently in Hindi, why not write it, right? It There is no reason why, because you've written a story once, and then it's your story, not somebody else's. If it is somebody else's story, you absolutely have to stick with it, right? But it's your story. You wrote it in English, it took a form, it took a shape. But if while you're trying to translate it in Hindi, it's insisting on going elsewhere, why not go with it? See where you end up. That's that's great advice. Somehow I, I, I was sensing that this is the direction I have to take, but I just didn't have the courage to admit to myself that, you know, I need to go there. So, so thanks a lot. Thanks. And, and, and if you still want, a, a, you know, a, actual translation of your English version, then perhaps give it to somebody else. But, you know, if, if, yeah, you know, you I mean, there are, Sorry. there are examples of where people have translated their own works, right? I mean, Ovi Vijay's oh, Kasak okay. in the Idihasam comes to mind, the legends of Kasak. So just one more thing, like, when I do it in the reverse direction, you know, like, something that I've written in Hindi, and I want to translate it with English, I stick to the main thing, you know, hmm. it, it becomes more a technical problem. Whereas when I'm writing in Hindi, it becomes it very, very quickly after the first paragraph becomes a creative problem. And I mean, I'm not to say that the, the technical problem is not creative, but, but you know what I'm saying, right? Like I tend to stick more to the original when I'm translating into English, where in the reverse direction, my, my mind goes everywhere. And that's maybe because English is the second language, right? This is about your own work you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about mine. Okay. I don't know. I mean, it, might it be that story that probably needs <laughs> another life? I don't know. Yeah, I, I've tried it with, with different words, but anyway, yeah, that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> I just uh, sorry. It's already been two hours and Jessie has been oh. kind enough with the time. <laughs> has it been tough? It's gone so well quickly in two hours. I didn't realize it was two hours. But Swati, you had a question. I was just wondering how was your experience of, uh, how was this book received in England? And, you know, of, there are so many people in of so many different countries in India with so many different Englishes in India, how is it received by people or is, has it been received mostly by Indians? It's not been published outside India yet. It is um, not no, the Kindle version is available for everybody, but it's not available, you know, because I don't know this for sure, but as I understand it, you need a different publisher because this is HarperCollins India. Um, and even HarperCollins UK is not publishing the same books that is published in India. so. Diary has been um, scheduled to be published in the US and UK in next March by a publisher in based in Texas, I think. Um, but Mustache has only been only been out in uh, well India or South Asia, but not not in the UK yet. So I don't know. Thank you. It's been yeah. wonderful to have. Uh, we we have. A tradition of taking a picture at the end of a session. So if everyone can just turn on your cameras, we'll just take a pic snap. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been quite wonderful, although we didn't speak much about your own writing. I would love to hear that. Maybe another session. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jaisi, a lot. Thank you, Jaisi. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, so thank you very Bye. much. Thank you so For much. our uh, sessions and other sessions, you can join us. You're most welcome to join us and hear more about us and contribute, and we can learn from you tremendously. <laughs> Great. I, I, will, I will see when I can join because it'll be interesting to hear about what all of you all are working on as well. So, yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, so, but, maybe Sumit uh, send Jayasree a schedule.
the way you know uh, our schedules maybe yeah. and the link and she would join us whenever she could yeah that'll be great thank you thank you so thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. yeah bye bye it's wonderful bye.